Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, I am Tatiana Arias, and as most of you already know, I am the new um, orchid research botanist here at Mary Selby. And today um, I would like to talk to you or give you an update of the activities that I have been developing here um, at Selby and mostly so this is what my talk is going to be about I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about um, the research plans and some of the research that is ongoing in the neotropics particularly in Colombia which is where I am from uh, and then I'm going to go to talk to you about the field work that I am uh, or that I have been or that has been taking place in Colombia for the past three years and how that's tied to outreach and community sciences experiences in a region of Colombia, in a particular region. And then um, I am going to talk to you about what my orchid research in Florida or how my orchid research uh, in Florida is looking like. And I think that I have this, um, yeah, I think that I'm going to talk about Florida first, but I remember. So all of you um, know that uh, Mary Selby is a great place to study orchids and in particular, in in particular neotropical orchids. And many of you also know that um, uh, orchids are my model organism. So I chose to study orchids to understand ecological and evolutionary processes that have taken place um, in, the, in the neotropics, I mean in the Americas. And um, I use integrative approaches to understand how orchids or how these model organisms to me have um, evolved and why and where. So to me, it's really important to integrate the environment, the organisms itself, and uh, the diversity that they have, the orchids have. And uh, basic research like this is really imperative because most of orchids uh, and most of plants and animals in general are, are threatened by habitat loss and of course um, global warming. So we have gone in this um, left panel here, let me have a laser pointer. We have gone from uh, this story here in which um, farmers and, and conquistadores came to, to the neotropics and lots of uh, other explorers came to take all our biodiversity and take it away to Europe. Um, and this was probably the major, the major threat that orchids used to have uh, in the past. And now this is what we are seeing, like orchids are, orchids and in, in other organisms are really losing uh, their habitat. And in particularly, uh, I grew up in the mountains, in the Andean mountains, and this is where I'm from and where I want to keep working. Uh, and the Andes are a very incredible place to work uh, to work in, uh, the Andes are uh, have approximately one percent or less than one percent of the of the land surface of the Earth, but uh, they have an incredible percentage of biodiversity, as uh, that um, as you saw in the last um, slide, we are losing. And we think also that global warming is gonna be affecting these mountainous areas more than many other ecosystems, although that's ar arguably, but, um, but there is a lot of effects that you can see now from global warming in these ecosystems. So 
in that that was my um, little introduction to to the, uh, let's say like the biological the biological the biological meaning of what I want to do, you know. But let's uh, go in depth in what my research is about, or what my research uh, yeah is about. So pretty much during my, the rest of my life, pretty much. What I want to do is to understand uh, the genetic basis uh, of the epiphytism in neotropical orchids and how that epiphytic uh, habit, uh, habitat or that epiphytic uh, vegetative way or that epiphytic form of living. Epiphytic plants are plants that grow on plants. They germinate and they complete the life cycle in um, in a host that usually is a tree, but it can also be a surface as a rock or yeah any other um, surface. And they complete all the life cycle in there. And in orchids, in particularly, uh, and in particularly in neotropical orchids, when they arrive in the Andes, uh, there was an explosion, uh, like an spectacular diversification of orchids um, in these mountainous areas and in other ecosystems uh, around uh, the neotropics, but mostly in, in, in the Andes. So I would like to understand how this combination combination of morphological and functional characters have allowed the diversification of um, these uh, specific epiphytic orchids and how or was the pattern of um, was the pattern of um, or how those um, particularly morphological characters and functional characters, how allowed the spectacular diversification of plants or of specifically orchids. You know, so this is the part um, that you see here. So environment, functional characters, and orchids also have this amazing relationship uh, with other organisms that can uh, be also a really important explanation for why uh, epiphytic orchids are so diverse, you know, and I do or I want to do this through or, or using different approaches. Um, I work with molecular biology in many different ways, uh, so I like to understand the genetic phases of some of these molecular or some of these, I'm uh, sorry, morphological characters. And I, use, and I also use uh, molecular biology to understand the relationships among organisms. So with that, I can understand in a really big group of orchids, how these traits or these morphological traits have evolved and how that is related with some other environmental or um, geographical or climate related traits you know and as i say before that is all very important for conservation and in general education in sciences in the sciences so um a, a big um challenge that i have Mm, by doing research here at Selby Gardens is to try and integrate uh, what I know about orchids, what I know about molecular biology with this amazing resource that I have here that is um, the collections that we have. The living collection, the herbarium collection, and the spirit collection, and this library that is also a pretty amazing resource here. So in... Well, like during the time that I have been here thinking about my questions, scientific questions and what I want to really do and accomplish in the next few years, I stumbled across or across this paper and um, 
that is basically a review that is showing how these databases um, are growing and growing and growing. And every time we have more and more data and we need to learn how we can um, integrate all this data, you know, to actually answer or, or this big data to actually answer uh, the scientific questions that I talked to you about in the previous slide. And uh, for those of you that are not that familiar with like the plant genomics aspect of what I do, I think that this is a really good tool to predict how certain groups of orchids could respond to climate change. So plant genomics, uh, and I mean this in a broad sense, plant genomics and, and encompasses many, many different fields. I am just putting in, uh, all those in one single word, but uh, we could understand how tolerant to stress uh, orchids are, how, resil how much resilience they can have if the environment is changing, what is the, their genetic diversity and how could they adapt to different environmental or uh, changing environmental uh, conditions. So as you can see, those are very, oh, those are very valuable tools for uh, future conservation plants in particular in the orchid family. Okay, so let's uh, go more in depth about what I have been doing ever since I came, I came to Selby. And actually, as many of you know, I had to wait for a very long time for my visa to be, um, to be expedited, to be expedited. So, um, once I have like the complete, um, or once I knew that I was coming for certain, we talked to Bruce about doing some field work uh, before coming here. So taking advantage that I was there. And one of the groups that I am really interested to understand is this group of, uh, or this genera of Pleurotalinide that is super diverse and endemic in the Andes, particularly in the northern part of the Andes where Colombia is. You know, these plants are tiny. You know, I wish that I could have a ruler here. I, I didn't think of this, but this is not more than four centimeters uh, long and uh, yeah, long. So these are a group of plants, as I say, that are very diverse. And um, in Colombia, we have great young plant taxonomists that have been like working and understanding really well um, the diversity within this group of or this genera lepantes. So together with uh, my colleague Alejandro Zuluaga, Sebastian Moreno is a student, which is the plant taxonomist that is let's say expert uh, in Lepantes. And uh, so Alejandro Zuluago is from Universidad del Valle. Laura Esserman uh, is a um, um, researcher, a plant researcher at uh, Atlanta Botanical Gardens. And Laura, so, so this is the part where I have I have the uh, taxonomical resource, resources to work in this group. Alejandro is the director of the herbarium at um, Universidad del Valle. And on the other hand, Laura just published um, this really nice paper in which she developed a molecular tool that is very informative for uh, genera um, like Lepantes. You know, so we formed this collaboration. I am also most of uh, the time working with Q with Oscar Perez at Q, which is a collaborator of mine. 
So what have we done so far? And what did I do before I came um, here to Selby? I, I did this expedition called La Expedición Lepantes de Colombia. And I went all the way from Medellín, all the way south uh, 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 to Putumayo. And I um, visit different places that were or were by Alejandro, by Sebastian, and by other experts were to know to have rich diversity of species in this genus. So in total, in about two weeks, we collected about 145 species of Lepante of uh, 350 that we have for the, or that have been reported for the genera in total. We found, we found six new species. We visited around like three, 10 Colombian um, departments. So amazing, pristine cloud forest. And um, not only did field, field work, but thanks to the connections that I have in Colombia with growers there, we were also able to visit um, some living collections and get some material from there. So that's why this number is so high. Some, as I say, uh, Lepantes, uh, uh, or according to recent hypothesis, Lepantes or Lepantes affinity, there is taxonomy that divide Lepantes in an infinite number of other genera. I'm more of a clumper. I like to put everything together. Um, have approximately more than uh, 1,500 species this affinity. And uh, they have been, um, say, hypothesized uh, the, this affinity appeared approximately 80 million years ago when mountains, like the northern part of the mountains, were uplifting. And if you, if you add up that mountains have, are lifting and that apart from that, these plants are tiny, you know, and they are growing in another dimension that is the dimension of a tree that has like different heights. Uh, you will think that there is a, um, yeah, that these plants are so diverse because they have been specializing in different niche within the ecosystem and within all the diversity that there is in that ecosystem. So to inform our, our collection trip, we, we use these maps that Sebastian, this guy, um, is doing using distribution patterns to understand how or which are the endemic or where are the endemic Lepantes distributed or where is like the highest rate of endemism within the genus in Colombia and also which is um, this, this is richness. So this also help us to inform the places uh, where we should uh, go and collect these plants. So I come back to my initial big question, the question of my life and how diversification, environment and history get together to form this um, amazing or to, to give rise to this amazing uh, number of species and yeah, within, within the Andes. And this is what I told you before, you know, and some people have already hypothesized how many of these characters that are ecological characters, uh, geographical characters, and also morphological and functional characters have accelerated evolution in the neotropics. So what are we doing with these collections that we have from Lepantis? Uh, we are building phylogenies to understand how certain characters evolve, how long ago, uh, and what could have been responsible for this um, explosion of diversification and high endemism that we see in these plants. So that's 
the one, the first one that I did, okay? And this is a work in progress because we haven't gotten the samples here. Uh, it's really hard to get to bring um, orchid tissue, orchid samples, uh, herbarium data, or herbarium material here to to the US and to everywhere to move across borders, uh, orchid material, because they are under the, under the CITES restriction. So we need to get all the permits together in order to be able to bring the, the tissues and the samples here so we can do the next step. So I hope um, this is in progress and I hope that I can have these tissues here very soon so I can start to actually doing the sequencing part and the analysis part of this um, really cool work. So a second question that has been um, making me more and more and more curious about the evolution of orchids is this one. Orchids have really tiny dust like seeds. These seeds don't have any food, food reserves whatsoever. So in order for them to germinate and grow into a seedling, they have to form this mandatory uh, symbiotic relationship with fungi, particularly with mycorrhizae, to be able to get energy to grow and develop into an adult. So apart from um, the, the relationships between fungi and orchids, there is also the relationship between orchids and pollinators. These relationships can be incredibly specific and incredible um, and, can, uh, and can be driving also the evolution and diversification of orchids at such a rapid, um, in such a rapid uh, way. So I have to say that I'm really biased um, in some groups that I study. I like, I like them and I wanna study them just because they look beautiful. Um, and I think that they should also have a beautiful uh, story behind why they look like they do. And this is probably one of my favorite groups ever. They are uh, Mas de Valias, and they are from the um, subgenera or a subgenera called Meleagris. And within Meleagris, there is this nine species. I think that there is a little bit more, but um, I could only get a handle on this nine. Um, these plants used to be really common in urban areas, some of them. Some of them used to be really common in urban areas like in Medellin, where I'm from. Uh, and they, have, uh, they are right now very endangered because of habitat lost. Apart from that, so there is really hard to grow them in vitro. So we have been working in germinating the seeds from mass evaluator tent, like doing cross pollination and doing all sorts of pollination experiments with uh, flies and cages and everything. We have been doing that for three years and only until, um, Late last year, we finally got some seeds to germinate. And you can see that they are not um, many individuals here. I can see two or three of them. But this was a huge step for us, just making sure or getting the right environmental conditions that the mycorrhizae is providing to the seeds. Um, in vitro. So this is artificial. How we did it is artificial. It's now with the mycorrhizae. But apart from that, I'm also collecting tissue from the different populations of these species. And I'm also collecting roots for, um, for several things, for identifying all the fungi that grow in the roots of these plants. You can do that through 
extraction of environmental DNA, what is called environmental DNA, and also through um, cultivating the fun fungi or fungi that grow in these roots. So here, this is a Petri dish with potato destructs agar. There is a root here, you know, and this is the ring of fungi that are developed around this piece of, of root. So now what we need to do is to extract DNA from these, uh, make a morphological description too, to be able to identify with which type of fungi or fungi these are, okay? So once, so of course there is gonna be contamination um, there is there are fungi like everywhere, literally. So some of these um, colonies might be contamination, but some of these colonies can also be mycorrhizae that are very important for the growth of, of these orchids. And maybe if we are really, really lucky also for the germination. And that has been proven in many other studies. So I put this other figure here. This is not, not from my study, but this is the idea that I have or where I'm going with this, apart from the scientific questions that I am not going to explain here but um, in detail, but it's pretty much combining history or combining molecular data and molecular diversity data with um, fungi diversity and yeah, fun, fungal diversity, et cetera, within these plants. So that's a question that I have. And, and with the environmental factors that might allow, so um, pretty much comparing if the diversity of fungi in each of these plants is the same or different according to the different species of lineages or to the environment, okay? And also I have this other idea that I would love to execute and that could be used in many types of orchids here in Florida. For example, this is from uh, some Chinese that were doing reintroduction of dendrobium. So what they did is like they uh, mix orchid seeds, they mix uh, dry mycorrhizae into these tea bags and within those tea bags, they put them in a, in a tree surface or in a, that's called a forophyte, the, the tree where the, the epiphytes grow. And you see that there is plant, uh, plants growing here, dendrobium plants growing here. So this will be a pretty amazing way to reintroduce orchids and um, uh, make sure that they will germinate. Okay, so let's switch gears here a little bit. Let me see how much time do I have left. Um, and let's talk about Florida. And the more I read about Florida, the more I read about uh, Florida ecosystems, uh, the more I fall in love with Florida because it is, I think, the weirdest place on earth. And I think that is very, very, very in danger. And I think that the vegetation here is super cool and um, super, so that can disappear pretty quickly if we don't take um, care and try to, yeah, do some conservation measures for some of the species not to disappear in this region of the world that is so unique. So I guess that if you live here and you work at Selby or you volunteer at Selby, you'll know that there is a many orchid species here, not like in the neotropics, but you know, for being where we are, there are many. Some of them are epiphytic, but the majority of them are not. Some of them are native from here and some have come from outside. And we also have few endemics. And 
looking at this and I'm like, I want to do a, a review that I want to publish in a scientific journal uh, of what, what kind of research in orchids do have we, have we done in, in Florida? So we know like what best approaches we can take um, to study certain things, etc. So when you see this, you see that mostly, it's mostly terrestrials or what are the gaps in which I should focus my research on. So most of the plants that have, or of the orchids that have been studying here are terrestrials. Uh, there is, has been a lot of taxonomic and systematics work uh, done in the state. Um, lots of um, interaction interaction with other organisms and ecological studies, anatomical and some other population level and conservation uh, studies have been done in Florida. Um, so let's talk, giving you that background, let's talk about what we are starting to do here. So this summer, this undergraduate student from USF is going to be working that um, we got this um, small grant for her to, to come to Mary Selby and work for us. And what she's going to be doing with me and with Sean and with in general with the botany and some of the horticultural team is to help us to evaluate the orchid collection that we have at this point and how we can again identify gaps or identify a strength, a strengthness or weakness that we have within our, our collection to be able to make a plan on how we grow this collection, uh, what we need to make uh, the species not to get sick, how are we going to make sure that some of the germoplasm is preserved, and to answer many other biological and horticultural questions that can help us to understand orchids in first place and also to um, make our collection one of the best or the best in the world. Okay. So that's one. The second project that I'm working in right now in some some people from the Friends of the Little Salt Spring, Salt, Salt Springs contact me really early on about these um, really mysterious species that they didn't know if it was like two species or one species. This is Sacoila lanceolata, Sacoila lanceolata variedad paludicola and Sacoila lanceolata variedad. Um, Lanceolara. So you can see that one has a widespread distribution to Florida, and this is like the northern and in general a widespread distribution across the neotropics. But this is the southernmost um, part of the distribution of this species that is pollinated in other places down um, down south Florida by hummingbird hummingbirds. It hasn't been reported as being pollinated by hummingbirds or bees here. And this Sacoila paludicola, which is res, uh, restrained or res, restrained, which is like only in few places or, or in few counties in Florida and is rare and also occurs in Cuba. So what we want to know um, is whether there is the morphological differ differences and ecological differences that we see within or uh, between these two species, how um, they are gonna, or how they, um, I mean, if they are a species complex or more than one species, or if they are all the same. How do we do that? We do that again, using molecular biology. And through molecular biology, we could also understand many other geographical and demographic uh, questions that we'll have about this species. Last, and to go 
into the last 10 minutes of my talk, uh, I want to tell you about another student from New College that has also gotten some money to do research in, um, in orchids. And she also contacted me and said, like, I love orchids. I want to work with you, etc. And she came out with this idea that I just think that is like mind blowing. And it's pretty much, she wants to understand how the soil and the below ground, ground organisms are affecting the pollination rewards that an orchid, an orchid is offering to, um, yeah, the, the visitors, the visitors, you know, like sands or, I don't know, mm, nectar or some other characters that are important for that. And we are being, we are going to use this like flagship species that is in Cyclia tampensis that is all over the place, in, in, um, including Sarasota. Okay, I'm going to skip this one and go into what I think that all of you wanted to know and many of you have been asking me about that is like, what were you doing in Colombia? Well, um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you now what I was doing in Colombia, apart from what I told you at the beginning. So I have this project of mine that is like um, something that I didn't think that is what's going to become so big and that now is like become it's like really popular and that is an approximation to join or to bring a bunch of different aspects of science with community sciences together and this has exploration, horticulture, try to develop in the future green economies and all this together with uh, the political situation that uh, we are living today in Colombia. So to do this, so we or I have um, the fortune to, to go, like I, I rented an Airbnb because I was going to a conference in Florencia, Caquetá. And uh, end up that the person that I rented this room from, Mari, which is here, is this person here, uh, end up that she was in love with orchids. And I am in love with orchids. So we were like, you are my, my best friend. I want to work with you. Let's do something together. And she started telling me about her community, um, which is El Manantial. El Manantial is a reserve within, in the outskirts of Florencia. And within a manantial, there is a group of people, mostly these, we are missing some people here, uh, that have formed this association called Uruki. And they uh, want to do ecotourism together with like diversity and cultures and things like this. So based on what the, yeah, and the, so I forgot to tell you that there is also indigenous communities living within this reserve. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them. But um, so we put together this um, proposal in 2019, and it will be to combine science and working with the university and within the academic university, Universidad de la Amazonia is the regional university, and to work with El Manantial community as a pilot to see if this will work or not. And it seems like it's working just fine. So from the scientific part of it, we did or we are doing. This is still ongoing because I got more money to keep working on this from the Colombian government. We did, uh, we are doing, sorry, exploration, inventories, and going all about first about the Andino Amazonian region. We are expanding now, but we have a ton of work to do. This is, of course, only orchids. Okay, then we did. Um, an exploration of, so of the horticultural potential of what we have in what we are collecting and what is um, or what grows naturally in the region. Okay, and we also were able to start an in vitro cultivation lab. Remember, orchids 
cannot grow without the mycorrhiza. And if we uh, can provide the orchids the nutrients and the specific things that they need to grow, they can grow a, to a ton of the, like since they produce millions of seeds, they could grow uh, in mass. Okay, and we did this bringing all the living collections to the community nurses for local species reproduction. And also in the, in the short term to do ecotourism or ecotourism, we know that that's something that people like. Orchids are, as I say in the previous slide, are the pandas of the plant world, okay? So this is what we have done so far within the reserve, um, the, in the Oscar of Florencia, we have, we always do field trips there to monitor the species, but we have also been in all these different places and found life, all these different uh, orchids in different parts of the Departamento del Caqueta, the Caqueta department, okay? Of course, everything that we collect and bring to the nursery, we don't poach from the field. We get from the floor, from, from the forest floor. Now, so we also, last year we published a catalog or a guide of the orchids that we have growing in El Manantial. And these field tri trips have been really fun because I am not, um, only going with my students that are helping me to collect, to make sure that all the plants are going in the right way, way package and everything. But we are interacting with all these different communities and uh, telling them about what we do and why we do it and how they could also do it and how to properly do it, do it to not damage the orchid diversity that they have there. And now this year has been really rewarding because now we have a huge uh, living collection and greenhouse in Florencia in El Manantial. We are teaching in all these places how they can reintroduce orchids that they found in the floor of the forest in all these different locations that we visit. And well, I am actually not doing that anymore, but my students, and the community is doing this. I just sit and watch what they do. And then I tell them, this was good, try to improve this, blah, blah, blah. But they are the ones doing this. So this is our greenhouse. This is Mari, the person who is in charge of all this. She's a tremendously hard working woman with an, like really sad living, story, I guess, like story of life um, marked by violence and etc. And uh, this uh, student of mine, and this is all that we do uh, in this great house, in this greenhouse. We, now that we have this, we, we do all this uh, recording of phenological and photographic re um, records. We do use them the collection to do workshops in which we invite a broad spectrum of people from the community and for, from Florencia. And I have to say, this project has been really popular around the region. Like people know who we are and know what we are doing and really want to participate. So orchids are viral in this um, department now or orchid study become viral. So my students uh, go there every other day or I don't know how much and they when things flower they uh, make vouchers, um, they split living plants, they do all the horticultural work but they also take important information for me and for horticultural purposes but also for um, the ecotourism for ecotourism uh, purposes, because these things are, or these phenological things are important things for us to know, to be able to offer the tourists a good, um, 
amount of flowers when they come. You know, we don't want the, the, the tourists to go and everything is in a vegetative state. Okay, so she follows the orchid phenology of individual species, the flower numbers, etc. So it sounds like December is the, the, the time to go. And this is also important in ecological terms if we will think of these plants in the forest. These are some of the beauties that we have in this um, place. Just wanted to show you that and I'm running out of time. So let me go very quickly through this. Uh, pretty much watch um, we we so initially there were the only publication that we have for this department has 70 species reported. But now we have more than 30, 150 species, and I am soon going to publish a checklist for the department, including all these new uh, records that we have. Um, we have done um, with specialists and with producers and doing the checklist and going through a bunch of other things. We have done a characterization or we have picked some of the species that have horticultural potential. This is done mm, very okay objectively, you know, um, and these are some of these species that got the highest scores because they are um, easy to reproduce, they are not in danger, um, they grow at certain elevation, etc. Okay, so let me show you some. This is one, Scoleriopsis biloba, one of my favorites too, and this is all the information that we use to, to pick it as an horticulturally important plant that we could grow. Just to give you an example, this is another one, Cattleya violacea. My student Pilar also comes and auto pollinates uh, everything that is growing. Sometimes they produce fruits, sometimes they don't. And if they don't, that's also very important scientific information. She comes, she learned, we train her to do in vitro cultivation. So this is going pretty well, really slowly, but it's going pretty well. And we hope to have a bunch of plants later uh, that we can uh, massively reproduce to re to do augmentation or repopulation and also one day hopefully to sell. Um, this is them, um, oh my God, I'm running so much out of time, but I wanna tell you this. So this is uh, the, the reserve and what we have done is like in each of these parcels or in each of these farms, we have uh, make a little station. Everything is related to orchids, but in each station, like the tourist is learning something different about the story of El Manantial or about uh, the story of the Caqueta, the different cultures present in Caqueta, et cetera, et cetera, plus orchids. You know, and some of these parcels also have little gardens with orchids. They also have little gardens with orchids here. This is the the big nursery. Okay, so there is a lot of involvement or there has been a lot of involvement from people. Again, here, Mary is teaching the community how to grow orchids. Um, culture, so as I say, we have we have able to build a maloca or this hut where indigenous with El Mayor Raul can do the coca related things, but we also have like the cook. Anyways, if I try to look for the word, I'm gonna find, a lot, I'm gonna waste a lot of time. And with other indigenous like Coreguaje. Raul also has like a, like a garden with medicinal plants. Lots of publications. These are informal publication. I wish that I have money to like actually publish these. These are all electronic but manuals to cultivate, guides of, for hummingbirds, for butterflies. We are making a butterfly and a hummingbird garden, and then some uses of and stories about the Witotos. Okay, I'm gonna leave this here because you probably are very tired by now. 
um, only to tell you this last one that um, is that it's not growing only in Caquetá and in other reserves and in other connections, but um, we are actually going to have a documentary made by this person in California, Emily Cohen, and I'm traveling with her to uh, La Tagua here in the middle of nowhere um, to record the first part of this or the pre-production part of this documentary about the project. And also uh, Jaime Gongora from Sydney University, he's Colombian, invited us to do this project in another region of Colombia with XFAR Convex. So our project is expanding. Anyways, that's it. Uh, I hope that you now know what I'm doing and how my conservation and research in Colombia is going. These are some of the institutions that have helped me and I thank the communities and my students and many people around the world that make this work possible. And with that, um, I'm gonna take questions. Okay. Thanks for sharing your research projects. Thank you and welcome. Nobody is asking any questions. So I invite you, if you have any questions, go to Q&A or to the chat. Or if you have any questions here. And, oh, you know, Tatiana, it does look like one question actually just yeah. came through yeah. about an idea of the economical mm -hmm. impact on communities. Do you want to just speak to that quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so do I have any ideas? No. So for the first uh, project that we have, this is, has been like uh, a one year project and the second year project for the first one, we did a, um, how do you call this, like a, a kind of like a commercial plan. And we also did um, like a marketing or like a market study. Uh, that gave us some insights on what we could um, do. It wasn't like, you know, like I have to really do this with my nails. The money that I get to do all this is like not much, honestly, but we try to make it work with the money that we have. So it would be really nice to have, um, to have an expansion of all these like economical things and how we could explore um, ecotourism and all of this uh, in a more formal way. I am not an anthropologist and I am not a economist, but I would love if any of you have any experience on, on this and wanna help uh, to help me, that would be amazing. <laughs> So yeah, to answer that question, pretty much I don't know yet. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. Um, and thanks for listening to what I have to say. <laughs>